As advanced technology is now making data collection and analysis easier, there's a growing movement to ground government decision making firmly in data. This panel is going to explore the shift to data driven management and examine how government leaders are already using this approach. So please join me in welcoming our panel. Nancy Potok, Chief Statistician of the United States and Chief of Statistical and Science at the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, and Ted McCann, Assistant to the Speaker for Policy at the Office of the Speaker of the House. Moderating is our own Tom Shoup, Executive Vice President and Editor-in-Chief at Government Executive Media Group. And with that, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Annie. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being with us this morning. Um, so, if nothing else today, you get to tell your friends and family that you performed on stage at the Shakespeare <laughs> Theater, right. and I will back you up on that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Claim to fame. Um, so, we're here to talk about evidence-based management, um, and I would venture to guess there are few things in Washington that are less partisan than evidence-based policy making and management and budgeting. Um, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I guess, I was up on the Hill for the release of the report of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy Making, and Nancy, you were a member of that. Um, and it was interesting to see Speaker Ryan and uh, pa Senator Patty Murray on the day that there were rather intense negotiations going on over a continuing resolution. I dare say I think it was probably their best meeting of the day. <laughs> um, but they were there together to promote this idea and to give their support for it. And we'll get to the Commission's work in just a minute. Um, but as a way to start, I thought I'd uh, ask both of you, it seems only logical to ground government decision making in hard evidence and data. Um, so why has that been so difficult? Nancy? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why it's been difficult, and that was one of the charges of the commission was to identify those barriers and think of ways to overcome them. Um, a, f a few of the barriers are um, the reluctance of agencies to share data when it's allowed by law, but sometimes it's not allowed by law. Um, so there's some legal prohibitions to sharing data. Um, the third is that it's very challenging to link data from different agencies to really create um, sort of a, a database with a lot of breadth and depth that's good for evidence building, um, mostly because there's a lot of different structures of the data that agencies have based on their legacy IT systems. And then, um, the other is, is uh, capability. There's not a lot of people in government um, who really have a, a good rigorous background in program evaluation and know how to design a study and think about it and understand which data they should use and how they should use it. So those are all um, barriers that can be tackled and that was what the commission was recommending was how to go about doing that. I think see? from a, a congressional perspective, um, you know, the original impetus behind creating the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy was actually um, a professor from Notre Dame uh, mentioned that he would really like to be able to get the data that Raj Chetty had to do his Equality of Opportunity um, project. And so the speaker sort of looked at me and was like, why can't we do that? Um, we sort of looked at it briefly and realized, at least at the congressional staff level, we're not smart enough to figure that out. And so we sort of said, hey, Nancy and other smart people, um, please uh, sort of figure this out for us. But yeah, we, we, I've run into a number of times um, when working with agencies that they just a lot of times don't have the data that we need in order to make decisions. And so, um, you know, expanding access was, was going to be really, really important in terms of trying to provide more evidence um, into the congressional decision making process. Great. I should mention we will leave some time for questions at the end and you can also submit them via the app and I would put the odds at roughly 50% that I'll be able to figure out how to get to them. Um, otherwise, we will take them. Um, uh, the evidence is not good. For that one. Um, I want to ask you about terminology. Uh, you hear the terms evidence-based 
policy making, evidence-based management, evidence-based budgeting. What are the differences, if any, between those? You want me to start? Okay. Um, evidence really is, um, in all of those instances, having um, accurate data and information that can inform your decisions. So if you're making policy about something and you're looking at various federal programs, I think um, most people would agree that you want the program to work. You don't want to spend a lot of money on something that's not working. Well, how do you know if it's working or not? You need data. Um, and there's lots of ways of getting that. You can do evaluation studies. You can do random controlled trials. Um, you know, you can do a lot of um, ways of looking at this. But um, that would be sort of evidence that would feed into policy. Um, Evidence-based budgeting should be connected to that because really what you want to do is put a budget together and funding together that's well supported. So um, really evidence is a, is a different way of talking about information and data that tell a story that's informing your decisions, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, I think they're all, like, like Nancy said, interrelated. Um, the way I sort of view it, uh, is Congress, when we're creating a new program, like you said, we want to make sure we know it works. Uh, in part, that's evaluating current programs. Uh, in part, that's when we create new programs. Um, a lot of times, Congress doesn't create clear outcomes that we want to achieve. Um, and so I think as part of the policymaking process, uh, Congress really needs to think a lot harder about uh, providing clear outcomes to the agencies for what this program we, we, we've created, we want to achieve with that, and then providing sort of a budget, um, you know, set asides or whatever it is um, for, uh, for the agency or program to be able to evaluate the program. And then finally, you know, the, the management of, of it has to be managed towards, okay, are we right. achieving the outcomes that Congress has clearly delineated? Um, and I think that's sort of how I would view those all interconnecting. Yeah, Tom, I think Ted brings up a really good point in terms of the management question, because I know a lot of people, when they see um, sort of evidence building and looking at outcomes and evaluation, they get a little confused between what's the difference between um, sort of performance measures, which I think people are very used to under GIPRA, um, and evaluation and measuring outcomes. Um, and right now, I think there is a, a gap because when you're measuring performance, you should be measuring the performance of the programs and are you meeting the outcomes. And I, I, you know, I've worked in performance measurement for a long time in government and I, I think that's always been a big challenge for people is what's the difference between measuring an output and measuring an outcome. And I think one of the things that the commission really would like to see come together more cohesively in government is the performance measures and the outcome measures um, so that people really have a way of measuring outcomes as opposed to, you know, we pushed X number of dollars out the door. More like, what did you achieve with that? Did you really meet the objectives and your mission goals when you did that? So does the commission's work, does it dovetail with things like GPRA? Um, so it doesn't specifically address GPRA, but there is a recommendation in there that says that agencies really at the senior level have to sit people down to work together in a coordinated fashion. So the, the chief performance officer, the CIO, um, a chief evaluation officer, if there is one, the head of the statistical agency who has a lot of the data, um, maybe a chief data officer if they're there, um, really need to sit down and say, what are we doing? Who has the data? Where is it in the programs? Who's collecting it as part of a program? And is it being used appropriately? And, and think it through in a strategic way instead of sort of these silos that we see now in agencies where GIPRA is kind of over here, a chief evaluation officer is over there, um, the statistical agency is somewhere. Um, and the CIOs are off doing, you know, FATARA and, and other things, um, that has to come together for a, a really strategic look at data and data management, the content and the infrastructure together. And um, that's really what the commission was looking for. So yes, the performance people have to be at the table for that to make sure that, you know, collecting those performance metrics is a meaningful exercise because it's a 
it's time consuming and agencies do it, but how is that tied to the outcomes? And that's where the evaluation comes in. I want to get into uh, the commission report a little bit. Um, uh, and that was uh, the result of 15 months work, is that right? Approximately, yeah. yeah. Um, so in the report, there were three things listed as among the greatest challenges facing evidence building today. Data access is limited, privacy protecting practices are inadequate, and the capacity to generate the evidence needed to support policy decisions is insufficient. I'd like to explore each of those in a little bit of detail. So starting with data access is limited. What's the issue there, Ted? Um, I mean, there's a, n a number of issues in terms of the access. Uh, I think, you know, the commission identified the fact that different agencies have different standards on how you can share data, right? GCs for each agency have different um, sort of interpretations of the various statutes governing their ability to share data, which is, uh, I think, limiting uh, for both programmatic uh, reasons and then for research and evaluation reasons. Um, and so that's one big area where I think administratively you, we could see some improvement. I think statutorily that would also be useful. Um, I think another place where the, the data, uh, the access is limited is um, generally, I think this is a big part of the recommendation that, that the commission had, Generally, we have all of this data that is collected um, under various uh, pledges and all of that, and right now there's no way for um, the agencies to really de-identify that data or make it usable in any, in any way, which is, is, makes sense in, in a lot of cases, and that's the way it should be, but at the same time, um, without anybody sort of going through that and figuring out, okay, are there ways that we can um, de-identify this and make this usable to outside communities, um, that restricts in terms of what what uh, what what can be used. So I don't know. Nancy would know better. Yeah, I think I think we see um, kind of a spectrum going um, to some of the things that um, Ted was talking about. Um, just to try to put it into specific, so it's a little um, more concrete for people. Um, one example where access to data is limited, that is very costly and kind of makes most sense, really is. Um, when you look at some of the statistical agencies. So statistical agencies collect all of their data under a pledge of confidentiality, whether it's from a business or from a person. And um, the statistical agencies, I mean, if you violate that pledge of confidentiality, you could go to jail, there's huge fines, sometimes $500,000. Um, so there's a real culture in the agencies of being able to protect data, and yet, um, we still have a situation where um, the Census Bureau, which collects information from businesses, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which collects information from businesses, is prohibited by law from sharing the address lists and the names of the businesses and how they classify what type of business it is. That could just save a tremendous amount of money. If they could just combine their list, it would help with all of the um, you know, reconciling the different data, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics gets theirs from the state, and the Census Bureau gets theirs from the IRS, from the tax records. Bureau of Labor Statistics is not allowed to see any of that tax data, and so therefore we have two different business registers. That's kind of the most simple explanation of laws that make no sense, or the absence of a law that says they can share their business registers and reconcile it. Um, at, at the other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of program evaluation that could be done to see how um, well certain programs work, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security benefits. Do they really make a difference for people's health outcomes or um, you know, income um, levels? And you can de-identify that data. You could combine some of it and you could put it in a very secure environment, just like you do with statistical data, and study what are the outcomes for people. Or, alternatively, if you don't do that, you have to sort of create a very expensive study where you have a control group in real life and you follow people um, and give them surveys and put kind of a big burden on them and a lot of expense to try to see what actually 
happened over a long period of time. And it just makes a lot more sense to look at the data that we have as long as we're protecting privacy, as long as it's de-identified, as long as it's in this very controlled environment and they're valid research studies. So the, to go to the second point on, uh, in the commission's, noted in the commission's report, um, privacy protecting practices are inadequate. Um, can you expand on that a little bit, Nancy? Um, yes. So, I, you know, we have the Privacy Act, and the Privacy Act um, protects uh, personally identifiable information. And I think most people in government are familiar with that. But what we see is, um, you know, different implementation in, uh, around government. And so there are a lot of agencies that actually do give access to um, protected data to researchers on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but we don't really see um, standardization across government. So when you look agency by agency, you see different protections and you see a different process that the agency uses. So how many agencies actually do a risk analysis before they allow anyone to do research using their data? Risk analysis is very important and what people need to think about in this day and age where there's so much information available is sort of what is that effect when you have lots of data from different sources? Some of it is open data. Some of it is, um, you know, just out there on the internet. Um, you can, I mean, you can find anybody's background, I think, for an introductory price of 99 cents, right? And, and learn all about them. So how do you protect people's privacy if there's some bad actors out there? Um, and you've got agencies all doing different things, and then somebody out there can pull all of the information that's been released, either through open data or you know, results of research, and try to re-identify people. So I think that's what the commission was very concerned about. We had privacy experts on the commission, and they said, we really have to do a better job government-wide of having best practices and standardizing what we're doing because it's very important if we're gonna do these kinds of studies that we not just look at these things sort of siloed one by one, this data set, this data set, this data set, but what's the overall, and some people call that the mosaic effect, you know, when the data sort of go out there into the world, how do you, you know, when you start connecting it all up, are you still protecting privacy? And there, there's a lot of, um, research being done that NIST is doing a lot of research on privacy protection and um, the statistical agencies are doing a lot. So I think what the commission's vision was, was we need to take these best practices and we need to make sure um, maybe in a centralized way that, that we have a center of excellence in government for protecting privacy. We can't just sort of leave it as a one by one agency by agency type of activity. Ted, are there steps legislatively in the pri privacy area that need to be taken? Um, I mean, I do think one of the commission's recommendations was to create a chief data, data officer, um, and part of that for each agency, and part of that would be so that you have somebody basically who understands data, and not just from a CIO standpoint and sort of physical security, but also from um, the point of view that, look, if you release this data set, it can be combined with this other data set, and now you have just re-identified a whole host of people. Um, I, I think Latanya Sweeney, she did a lot of work on that. Um, as Nancy just said, um, you know, right now, uh, agencies are, are highly uneven in their implementation of the Privacy Act. Um, it's highly uneven in terms of uh, how strong the security is um, for, for the data. And, and so getting a bit more um, sort of uniformity amongst that would be really, really important. Now, I don't think that's necessarily something that we have to do statutorily, but I do think it's something that at least Congress should look at um, uh, encouraging agencies to do, um, I mean, especially on the lower end. I mean, I think American people generally are very, very concerned about privacy issues. I know when we thought about creating this commission, that was a strong concern that we had, and we want to make sure, look, we're already collecting all this data. If we have all this data, how actually protected is it, right? And, and sort of, and that was one of the reasons why we wanted to include um, privacy experts on the commission. I think it, it really made it a, a very strong product uh, to have that uh, component there. Yeah, and I also um, think that there was a, the commission thought very hard about this, and um, 
while the commission recommended that there be sort of a central service in government that could help link these records together, the commission was very clear that there should not be a data warehouse with everybody's data in it. Mm -hmm. um, that you should put data together, just take the pieces that you need to do a particular study, and then, and then the data go back home to the original owners in the agency. So it's not um, that you know, all the data in government gets put into a central data warehouse. That was, we just absolutely were completely against that, but more like a service where if you have a project or an evaluation that you want to do and it requires confidential data or protected data, um, there is a service that is expert at this um, that can link that for you. Um, you can get secure access so that, um, you know, hopefully you're not exposing that data or being hacked. And then um, that service would also do the kind of review before you could release the results of your research to see, um, could this be re-identified? What's the risk of that? So doing that risk analysis, um, kind of all in one place. But then the data do not stay there, and it's not all in one place, because that would be a really big target, I think, if data from all programs, from all participants yes. were all in one place. So. Um, it's a, it's a different idea that technology enables that to happen now, and that's what the commission was really trying to put forth as an idea. The third major element the, that the commission explored was the capacity to generate evidence to support policymaking. And I want to ask you, Nancy, um, where did the commission come down on that and what, what needs to be done in that area? Um, so the, the commission really looked at um, access, which we've talked about, looked mm -hmm. at privacy, which we've talked about, and then building capacity in government is the third really key piece. We, we have a lot of researchers out there in academia who um, can really contribute to this by doing important studies, but I think the federal agencies themselves need to build an independent evaluation capacity. I think at one time, the government looked at evaluation a little bit more seriously, and as things happen in government, there's cycles. Um, and now I think we'd like to see it cycle up so that um, there really is um, an ability to look at the outcomes of the programs and, and make decisions based on that, on how you can improve the program, how maybe it's the management of the program, maybe you need to reshape the program um, in some way, um, but to really understand that. And so the commission very strongly wants to see evaluation capacity, an independent evaluation office um, that um, you know, is, is not sort of biased in terms of what the outcome should be, but can do a really objective study using the data that are available to improve the programs. And so I think that was key. Um, how do we go about doing that? How do we allocate resources for that in, a, in an environment where, and I think Ted would agree, we're not looking to grow the budgets. We, we're looking to prioritize and reallocate within the amount of money that are available in agencies. And, and um, so, you know, I think that's what the commission was recommending to agencies. Get, get your top people together, put a strategy and start building your capacity to evaluate, and that probably means reallocating resources to your priorities. I think Congress especially has shown a lot of interest in having a greater evalu uh, evaluation capacity by the agencies. I mean, uh, I think the best example is the McV program. I mean, this was created as a pilot program under, under George W. Bush and then codified in the, in the Obama administration, um, sort of using a tiered evidence model um, uh, with clear outcomes that we want to see. I think in the ESSA, the, the No Child Left Behind Reauthorization Bill, um, the colleague from Senator Murray's office, they had tiered evidence models in that as well. Um, my colleagues at Ways and Means are looking closely at pay for success and social impact financing type models, and, and all of that will require a greater evaluation capacity by the agencies. Um, I, think, I think members care a lot, are caring more and more about this. I mean, I hear a lot. Uh, regularly from, from members of Congress, you know, does this work, does this not work, like, why are we funding this? Um, and especially in a time of, um, you know, as Nancy mentioned, budgets that are frankly not going to be able to increase at the same rates as they were uh, previously, 
um, ensuring that we're getting good value for our money is, is really, really important both. Um, yeah, so it's, it's something that I think it's, it's going to be of growing importance in the future and something that uh, folks are very interested in. Yeah, so I, let me just add something to that too, because I have spent a lot of time, you know, I'm at OMB now, but I've spent a lot of time on the agency side, and I was a CFO. And I know when we talk about resources um, and reallocating and some of these things, um, sort of when I think about how would I react to that if I was in an agency, um, I, I would just like to put out there that, you know, I know firsthand people in agencies are very mission driven, very dedicated to the program and really want to do a good job. And this is a benefit to people in the programs. This is, what the commission was envisioning was not kind of, um, oh, let's see how bad your program is so we can cut it. That's not, that really wasn't the idea. The idea is that people who are really dedicated to mission, people who really um, want their programs to do what they're supposed to do and be successful, don't you want the information that tells you how you're doing? You know, not so other people can look over your shoulder and say, you should be doing better or you could do a good job, but just for yourself. I mean, I know when, when I was running programs in an agency, there was a lot of information that I would have loved to have to know how, how well are we doing? Are we really meeting our mission goals? And I couldn't get the data. I didn't have that information. I, I think a lot of people here have probably been in that situation. You measure what you can measure with the data that you have. And sometimes it's not the right data. And it's not answering your questions. So as somebody who cares about your program, who's responsible for it, and who really wants it to be successful, this is actually for you. I mean, we're talking about it like oh, OMB in the Congress, but this is actually something that will really help people who are managing their programs understand how to really make it successful. And I want people to understand that it's not something that comes from outside and drops on you. It's something for you. I mean, I'd just reiterate, I mean, the creation of the commission, our thought process was not about, oh, how can we figure out what doesn't work so we can eliminate it. It, it very much was, um, I mean, so Senator Murray and, and the Speaker got together for the first time doing um, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2013, right? So they worked very closely on that. And so they were sort of immersed in a lot of the budgetary pressures that we were facing, um, trying to increase the, the, the budget, budget caps. Um, and so a lot of it is just very much, okay, so how do we get the best bang for our buck and how can we improve programs? And, and to be honest, you have a lot of support for programs that can show across the aisle, um, uh, on both sides of the aisle, um, that can show strong support. Like McVie, I mentioned, has very strong support, um, both amongst Republicans and Democrats, because it can show very, very clearly, hey, this works, it makes a big difference, and, and we feel like we're getting value for our money. And so having greater uh, um, information, I think, can only be helpful. And, and to Nancy's point, if it shows that it's not working, then we, we probably want to do something different, right? I mean, we want to make sure that we're, we're achieving the goals that we're, we're setting out. Um, and it doesn't so necessarily mean you eliminate the program. No, or no, 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 but you want to shift other how, how you're doing it. Let, I mean, me, let me throw in an example It's the learning agenda, here. too, that you guys want to have, that we so want to have. when the, the commission um, was first meeting, a lot of people came and testified in front of the commission. And um, Ted mentioned Raj Chetty. So mm. a lot of people probably don't know who he is. He's a researcher. Um, in academia, and he does a lot of research with tax records. And he was looking at housing programs, and this is one of the examples he presented to the commission. Um, so while he was looking at housing programs, HUD had a program um, that was designed to move low-income people out of housing projects that were concentrated in the city because it was obvious that they were kind of magnets for crime, that they weren't well run, that there were drug dealers sometimes there. So HUD was very concerned about this because they're paying a lot of money to support a lot of these public housing projects. And um, so there was an idea that was put forth, well, we should take families and move them out of these concentrated low income areas and move them into more middle income areas and kind of scatter them around and that will create better outcomes for the kids because they'll be in a different environment. Well. Um, so when you looked at their program, um, when you looked at the outcome of, of the kids in general, they didn't have better outcomes. Um, they did not 
make more money, they didn't have better education levels. I mean, it, it was showing that the program actually wasn't working, contrary to what you might think intuitively that it would be good for the kids. So HUD was ready to kill the program because it wasn't producing the results that it was supposed to. And then Raj Chetty came in and he, he really dug into the data and what he found was that if you had families with children that were under age 14 and you moved them um, out of public housing and kind of integrated them into more middle income neighborhoods, they actually did have better outcomes. But if the kids were over 14, they really didn't do any better. That's a really important piece of information. That says, well, maybe we shouldn't kill the program. Maybe we should target families with young children um, rather than older teenagers um, if we're going to you know, give vouchers to families so that they can move into other neighborhoods. So that's the kind of evaluation we're talking about. So HUD, which was gonna kill the program, um, ended up tweaking the program to really target on the population that was gonna benefit from the investment um, and actually produce better outcomes for those younger children over their lifetimes. So that's a really important thing to do. Ted, some of the commission's recommendations are gonna require congressional mm -hmm. action. So what are likely to be the first steps legislatively and what does the timeline look like there? So, I mean, I think we'll, we're working very closely. Um, me, uh, our office and Senator Murray's office are working closely with uh, our colleagues on the Oversight and Government Reform uh, Committee, uh, OGR, OGR, my favorite committee <laughs> acronym. Um, uh, so they're, they're, we're working very, very closely. I, I think you'll see parts of the commission um, from that access, the privacy side, um, and the evaluation capacity side, all three of those um, will be included in the first round of, of legislation. I do think we'll probably take some of the easier things to sh sort of show momentum. Uh, one of the things we wanted to avoid was just having a commission be done, like normally happens in DC, and then uh, it just sort of gets put on a shelf and there's no action items surrounding it. So we, we worked closely with the committees of jurisdiction um, we'll continue to work closely with them. There's a lot of interest in this, um, not just from our office and Senator Murray's office, but there's the Open Data Act that just got attached to the, the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, and so senators and, and, and members uh, in the House are very, very interested. So I, I think you'll see us coming out with legislation, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, that will, again, a, a address both the uh, access, the privacy, and the evaluation side of this. And um, again, we probably won't be at the sort of the full, all of the recommendations, but I think we'll make it good. We're calling it a down payment, um, sort of setting a foundation for, for greater um, evidence and greater access and, and uh, improved privacy for folks. So. Great. Um, I should say we're about ready to take questions. I, candid admission, have been defeated by technology <laughs> on the app. That's <laughs> user error all the way. Um, but do get your questions uh, ready. We have people with microphones who are uh, prepared to uh, come running to your location. Um, and I'll just, uh, before we go to that, um, Nancy, you, you mentioned sharing data between agencies as mm -hmm. being an issue. What are the internal problems and hurdles there? Um, so some, sometimes agencies are allowed to share data because it's not tax data that's, you know, might be specifically prohibited. So let's say um, you have some program records that you want to share between agencies, and if, if you do that in a secure environment, it's allowed. Um, sometimes I think that the agencies have very different cultures, for example, and it can take a long time to get an interagency agreement between the agencies for example, because it goes through a lot of review processes. You have different sets of lawyers looking at it. Um, and that's a process that really needs to be standardized that, to break down those barriers that we create ourselves in government. There's no uh, legislation maybe could help that, but a lot of times it's just agency culture. And sometimes agencies want to share data. They're interested in doing that, but um, you know, in this environment, um, agencies that are running programs are very focused on their own production. And so well, I think what they worry about is, hey, we don't have the resources to devote to preparing our data to share with others. Um, 
you know, what are we going to get out of it? Why should we invest that? We can't pull people off of doing the programs to start cleaning up files so that they can share it with other agencies. So we have resource, culture, um, administrative slash legal um, barriers that can really slow this down a lot. And that's why I think it's very important for um, agencies themselves to have a good capacity to understand what is it that they want to know? What do they want to get out of this? What can they learn from their own data so that there's more incentive and motivation to um, make it available and to share it and to use it to do their own analyses? Great. I think we're ready to go to audience questions. Over here. Thank you. Um, so what role does OMB play in helping agencies take a more sophisticated approach in formulating their budget requests? And can you provide a few examples of best practice across the agencies? Well, I think, um, yeah, OMB can, can be very helpful in that regard. Um, I know there's a, I know when most people think of OMB, they're thinking specifically about, you know, a program examiner and OMB sort of looking at their budget. Um, but there's other parts of the OMB. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is looking across all of OMB to say, how can we bring our resources to bear? We have a, a team of people who are really working with agencies to build their evaluation capacity. To, um, there's a council of the chief evaluation officers um, I had a council of the statistical agencies that have a lot of data. So how do we get some synergy um, in OMB between, you know, looking at the budgets, between building capacity in the agencies, between thinking about the data availability, getting the CIO office in to look at the infrastructure for doing that. Um, and so that's, I think, if we start looking at this a little more holistically, then the agencies will be getting um, support and guidance um, all throughout their whole interaction with OMB um, that can really help the agencies think about this differently. Um, so I think you really, you know, the agencies should be looking a little more holistically and OMB is looking at this a little more holistically, I think, as a, as a result. And um, that can be very helpful to the agencies. So one of the struggles that we see a lot in our um, attempts to look at data collection across agencies is that um, agencies appreciate the data for their own purposes, but they don't always see value in sharing it because they're worried about comparisons between agencies that don't take into account their unique missions. Um, how can we start to incentivize agencies to compare their data um, and get past that fear of those comparisons? Yeah. I, really, you know, people make up agencies and people don't like to do things unless they, there's something, some value that they see in doing it. And um, I think that's not only true of federal agencies, but something else that we didn't talk about here, and that's state data. And a lot of times, um, you know, we're thinking sharing between federal agencies, but many agencies are are pushing money out to the states through block grants or other programs. I mean, billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars a year, right? Going out to state, local, and tribal governments. And um, part, of, part of what I'm seeing, because there's some really, really effective pilot projects out there, is you bring the parties together who own the data and who are running the program. So it may be two agencies together, or it may be the federal program manager and the people who are operating the complementary program at the state or local level. Um, they, they need to come together and say, what, are we, what do we all want to know? Um, how, how does combining the data, and let's do this like as a project together, you know, learn how to do data analytics, for example, um, learn how to use some of these programs that um, work with large data sets. Um, get some data scientists and some academics in the room, and let's really start to see what what we can learn together. Because 
that does a couple of things. One, it builds these very important partnerships so that we see the whole life cycle of a program and mission as it takes place not just at the federal level, but is it working at the state and local level. Um, and two, we're building um, you know, the capacity at all of those levels of um, learning how to work with data and analyze it and ask questions that are meaningful. And then three, when you do that and you actually start to use the data, it improves the quality. Um, you really care a lot. I mean, a lot of times we see federal agencies just putting requirements on states to report, for example. And the state data is reported. It's a pain in the neck for the states. It's a big burden. And it's not used for anything. It's not really high quality. Nobody's managing with it. Nobody's learning from it. So I think the way to overcome this, like what's in it for me, is to bring these parties together um, in an environment where they can start to explore the data together and answer the questions together and understand how the different parties are using that information and then improve the quality of it um, and build those partnerships. Those relationships are really important to build on an ongoing basis because, you know, the federal government does a lot, but uh, some, you know, really a lot of the implementation of federal mission does happen at the state and local level or tribal level. So I, I would say the way to get around that is you have to bring people together and figure out what is the common knowledge they're trying to build. I think we have time for one more quick question, maybe down here in front. Can you hear me? Am I on there? <laughs> um, the, um, this is a two-part question, um, but, but I think they could be short answers. The previous speaker spoke to a FUD factor, fair uncertainty and doubt with any uh, uh, policy that's in place from government. And, and really, if you were to add those three elements together, it equals trust. So part one of the question is, uh, what is government leadership doing to improve trust internal to government so that information could be shared? Part two of the question is, is there any one department or agency that you see uh, really doing better than others with regard to data management and, and providing uh, you information? And then one editorial thing. I've observed government for a long time, but I, I would say I've seen uh, that Venn diagram come together really well between defense, homeland security, state, and commerce many times on sharing of data. So it's not all bad. Um, on trust question, I, I do think, um, you know, the trust between administrations and Congress can sometimes not be great. Uh, I think a lot of that is um, dependent upon congr Congress uh, sort of being willing to, uh, I do, uh, we need to allow things to not work, right, without sort of, you know, starting to write letters and threatening oversight hearings and, and that type of thing. I mean, I, I, I was the staff director for the Social Security Administration, so I tried to make the, the folks at, at Social Security feel like they could tell me if something happened and we weren't going to immediately be, you know, trying to make a public case out of it, that we'd work with them and, and it'd be more useful for them to sort of come to us and work with us so that we could make sure that they got the things that they needed. Uh, that turned out, I think, I feel like uh, a very useful relationship when we ended up doing some legislation on uh, disability where we tried to reduce some of their, um, some of the burdens in terms of, you know, adjudicating cases and, and things of that nature, um, you know, just from some of the re reporting requirements and all that. So, um, and being able to have those uh, conversations with the agency was very, very useful. And so I think there is, at least from my perspective, some um, burden on, on Congress to be able to be open to that. I don't know from the executive branch. Nancy, you get the last word. Yeah. Okay. I. I guess I would go back to what I was saying before. You find the common ground in the mutual interests and you start to build partnerships. And when you start to work together in the same room um, with, you, you know, you start to build trust and you can build trust in these relationships between agencies. I've, I've had that experience myself being in an agency, like I, as I mentioned, I was in the Census Bureau and um, Census Bureau working with agencies to try to get data um, to create new statistical products. And it, it can be a, a, a long process, but there's nothing that beats that person-to-person -person interface and discussion 
um, to build trust because when you start to talk to people and you start to find the common ground, um, you find that your differences are less than you think. Um, and, and that carries over, I think, into the agency relationships as well. So um, I would just say, uh, you know, we, we really have to put more emphasis on, on collaboration and effective collaboration, and, and some of these other things will follow. Great. Thank you, Nancy and Ted, for being with us today and for your work with the commission, and good luck with the uh, implementation work going forward. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat>